So I'm going to talk about elephants, alcohol, tea, and you might wonder, am I at the wrong conference? But maybe, maybe. And I think uh, the point I want to make here is that the basic hypothesis being we haven't looked at one particular area as clinician and anthropologists, as ethnographers, what happens in the clinic space and the micro spaces of the interactions between patients and doctors and their families. And I want to just illustrate that by arguing that actually the clinic, which is supposed to be a site of healing, I'm going to argue that the clinic also is a site of violence. And that violent act takes place in many ways. And in the tradition of ethnography, I will illustrate with some field work. Uh, as uh, ethnographers, we are not so good with making nice lovely slides that you saw before. It's a bit messy. And because the social science concepts that I want to put out, I hope I don't come across as patronizing. Um, the work that I did here is in collaboration with a human geographer, Mark Barwa, at the School of Geography in Cambridge University. And, uh, I'm going to take you now to the uh, border of the outer Himalayan range in northeast India, adjacent to China, Burma, and Bangladesh. Um, there's a disclosure you see here that uh, I wanted to mention that there is a video clip that you will watch of an elephant. I haven't taken permission and informed consent from the elephant, <laughs> so that's something that I couldn't. But um, also, the video clip is. Uh, been done by my, made by my collaborators who wish please not to uh, video or copy it uh, because it's meant for professional dissemination. And obviously these are two important concepts that we keep coming back, the idea of Lacan's gaze and uh, I want to look at how the gaze of the clinician as a psychiatrist shapes the construction and the nature of uh, uh, turning someone into a stranger. And the second concept is that of nominalization, which is a term used broadly in social linguistics, which is turning nouns into verbs. It helps me when I work with the homeless people on the streets to ask the question homeless, and that opens up immediately vectors that help you decide and understand better what is it that no one is born wanting to become homeless and what are the forces that happen. And the same way, the stranger out there is not independent of those of us who generate in a relational manner the idea of uh, strangering and how do we conduct this purpose. Of course, the margin and the center are not independent. These are relational concepts. Uh, a center doesn't exist if there is no margin. So in that sense, a margin is a very powerful space. It can be inverted, as you heard in the previous talk, where you radically reinvert re and reassert your identity and say that black is beautiful. But again, the term stranger is a relational concept, and if you start looking at the verbs and adjectives that come from it, it might help us understand some of the forces where we are uh, dealing with the idea of strangers. So this is uh, the outer Himalayan range, the border with Bangladesh, China, and Burma. And I assure you, when we finish, you will certainly remember that you have your tea, uh, what has been happening, because a large part of the tea that comes into Europe is from this part. Now, what has this got to do with this conference? There's an elephant here. Um, this is a Pali manuscript where Lord Krishna is taming a wild tusker. If you notice, the important part there is that the tail of the elephant has gone up, which means that the elephant is very angry and hostile and aggressive. Uh, that's the part which I can't probably show here, the laser. That's the area in, in the sun. And oh, that's a very, very short of the place. So the fieldwork took place in this area, which is a wildlife area it is uh, uh, the population density of rhinoceroses and elephants is high but as we speak there is a serious problem and that problem is to do with I have permission by the way of the two ladies to talk about it is to do with uh, a lot of people who are mainly from low caste Arivasi families who um, have to run when uh, the floods come down from the Himalayas. Why the floods come is another issue because when you open up these vectors, you realize there's mass scale deforestation. The woods are being chopped, the banks are eroded. But where does that wood go? And then you start wondering, well, what is the wood here doing? And where is it coming from? And you look at big multinational companies who are interested in that wood. Of course, that's not the simple point, it's not the straightforward story. But when those floods arrive, these families have to run mainly with their children and pots and pans and run into elephant territory. 
because they have no other place to go. They don't have a social capital. Many of them are daily wage workers, workers on corporate DSTs. And if you're a daily wage worker, you don't have any benefits. You can be sacked the next day if you don't turn up. You don't have sick leave. You don't have any of the guarantees that you have of paid employment by the state. These are two widows whose husbands have been killed. Now what's happened was we did the field work. We found that because they started going into elephant territory and clearing up the land to live out there in what is called a subsistence agriculture, as opposed to this, which is a uh, corporate agriculture we found. The elephants are increasingly getting displaced, they're getting hungrier and angry because they need pasture to graze. They started attacking these villages, which are actually settlements into their territory, and in the process they placed in alcohol. Now they come only for the alcohol in large numbers. One peg or one drink for them is equal to about 60 liters of uh, local rice wine. And um, they communicate infrasonically, that's been established, and with the thumping of their feet. And it's a very sophisticated way to, to communicate with each other. Now they have changed, and as we change, they change us. We saw some sheep in the previous slide, but we are changing each other. So they're not coming anymore like a huge army. They come from the, uh, the two of them coming through the front end of the village, the rear guard action, the pincer movement, and they zero in on the mud hut, which they might be rice wine, break just that part of the wall, drink the wine, and then go on a rampage. In that process, about 10 to 12 men mainly are killed, leading at least eight to ten widows times three children with nothing for them. So these are two widows in their twenties still waiting for their compensation over about uh, almost eight years ago. And so of course this is what you see is the glorified version of tea, the elephant and how it is sold out over here. But the problem here is that the interesting conflation between tea and elephants and the enjoyment, it in some ways uh, conceals the suffering that is going on and then I want to talk to you about what the mental health professionals doing when people develop mental health problems there. If I have time I should bring you back to London to show what is happening in the clinic there where I ran an intensive care unit and to give you an idea about the project of uh, the pan lexicon. That's my own neologism which is an extension of uh, uh, the notion of uh, Jeffrey Benton's panopticon because I think we need to pay attention to how doctors writing and inscribing about patient suffering is far more dangerous and serious and has laterally spread out to other disciplines, particularly psychiatric nurses, who have lapped up the vocabulary. And the vocabulary is sanitized in such a way and cleaned up to suit the needs of the disciplines that work. So there's an economy around itself. In all of this, the patient's problem is not really, is forgotten in many ways. And I'll show you that. Um, so this is how the West glorifies the elephant that it has to be protected and the people have to be blamed. So everyone blames these poor people who go into elephant territory. My interest was in who's looking at the people's head. So the elephant has been glorified uh, by the media. And there you see Mowgli, you see elephants that were used at one time during the war. Uh, when tanks came and replaced with the British, when they came in, they still had elephants uh, as part of the army. The forehead is important because that's how you knock down the doors of fortresses. Uh, and that's why when you go to any of the old forts, you'll see uh, huge uh, spikes on it to prevent the elephants from breaking down the doors of forts. So now, the problem is so bad that as we speak, every day one person is being killed, either by an angry elephant who's likely to be drunk, and in retaliation at least uh, eight elephants a month are being killed. Remember the elephant is also an incarnation of an Indian god, Lord Ganesha. So there's a huge amount of guilt and ambivalence in trying to kill an elephant in retaliation. The debate is taking place to say that there is an encroachment that is taking place by big companies who are buying off the land, generating far more landlessness amongst the tea laborers who have very little place to go except into elephant territory. That's one part of a more complex problem. And the youth leaders have been talking about the problem of why they are being blamed instead of understanding their plight. And that's the amount of compensation, the damage to crops. We haven't looked at the human cost, but I'm going to talk about the human cost. One of the problems as a result of that is that the estate companies and corporate companies have started building fences, <coughs> electric fences, but nothing is working. People have tried bees, they've tried fences, they've dug trenches. More people have fallen into the trenches and broken their lips than elephants. They managed to navigate through the trenches as well. So this is a problem that is not going away, it's getting worse. 
these are the implications of the cost. The direct costs are very clear, loss of injury and damage, but they're the indirect costs. And I'm looking at the one which is from last, before the, the, the institutional costs, the hidden psychological costs. So people have to sit up all night guarding their crop fields in the process. They are exposed to malaria, trypanosomiasis, leishmaniasis, um, and uh, they can't sleep in the daytime. They can't work because they haven't slept their diet. Um, children also take turns. They don't go to school in the daytime. Um, but in order to face the elephant who might come at night, they do sip a little bit of rice wine. And elephants can smell rice wine about a kilometer and a half away, which compounds the problem. But once they walk on their land, this subsistence agriculture is destroyed. So this family will have nothing for the whole year. That's it. You're finished. Yeah, you're hungry. That, there's nothing left for you. So you have to crop, guard the crop to make sure the elephant doesn't walk on it. These are the deep plantation workers. And the elephants who are getting electrocuted, they're being blamed for um, drinking. And the word illicit has been introduced now. It's not illicit. It's homegrown wine for these people who are tired all day. They grow their wine in their huts. But now the framing by the state and wildlife agencies is that this is illicit liquor. And that's why. So people are getting criminalized for their behavior and activity. And this is how they put out these media statements. The elephant was drawn to the illicit alcohol stored in the victim's heart. Nearby liquor attracts them. And these are the problems of how elephants are having a drink problem. And then as a result, they end up killing. I talked about deforestation and how this is an important part. And these are the videos with whom I've been following up for the last few years uh, to see what is happening. It's not a simple, straightforward, linear narrative. There are many other events that take place, property disputes when the husband dies, <coughs> land disputes, uh, disputes with the in-laws, and various other problems that make things much more complicated. But the consequences of that are quite serious. This is a straightforward clinical assessment uh, to look at what happens to them. But there's hardly any, hardly any service available. But in the process, no one died, but in the process, an oil lantern fell over, and within a few seconds, the whole hut was set to fire, so they became homeless right away. They had no way to go. And um, the women were embarrassed, humiliated, with no clothes on. They had to borrow money at 20% interest rates from the local money lender. You can walk here with a credit card and buy a Mercedes with 8% collateral interest, but there you can't. You don't have a bank account. You're homeless, you're landless, you have nothing. You, and in, in that process of the hut burning down, Ramu's paper truck driving license got burned. Now, from that position to negotiate the complex bureaucracy to get a driving license back again for someone in that situation is near impossible. You have to just go through so many hoops and loops, pay bright, because it's a lucrative job. So he started getting withdrawn. They had to build a new hut. Father came back with whatever savings, but then he couldn't go back because he lost his job. And they went to another house with the borrowings. They were in debt. And Ramu started getting withdrawn, then he became paranoid, and he started suspecting that his wife was having an affair with someone in the village. And yet he became more irritable, more suspicious. He started smoking ganja and drinking. And he kept repeatedly saying, I want a job. I want a job. And he would hang around with the truck stopped, hoping that they would give him some job. But they wouldn't. And then it reached a point where one day he smashed the family bicycle. Now, bicycle is the only form of transport there for these people. And if you smash that up, then that's would be more difficult. Instantly, bicycles are not advertised on Indian television. It's cars and maybe motorcycles. So I see the city here full of bicycles. It just occurred to me that bicycles are not advertised. But this is for them the only way to move about. So when that was happening, as he got more and more difficult in his behavior, uh, they had to get him, he wanted a job, he said, I want a job. And so the trucks where they stopped, they gave him the job of a helper to unload the lorries, the stationary lorries. And when he was unloading a lorry one day, he fell from the, the truck on the floor. Nothing happened much, but the family members and people in the village said, it's time you take him to a psychiatric hospital because this is going to get worse. You need to do something. So they take him to the psychiatric hospital. This fieldwork was based upon a collaboration with a human geographer, myself, wearing two hats as an anthropologist and as a psychiatrist. So he's taken to a large mental hospital, which is a clone of the Maudsley Hospital in London. And you probably won't see because the writing is small, but what has happened is uh, 
First of all, the recording of the case notes for Rangu, which we tracked down his case notes, starts with disorganized behavior for 20 days following a fall from a truck accident. So as you notice, the narrative is reframed from a cultural one to an organic one. And then there is a whole discussion on head injury, loss of consciousness, no seizures. The preceding history of what happened with the family and the event, the loss of the driving, the, the elephants attacking, is just missing from that. So the narrative is shrunk, is changed from a cultural to an organic one, and then the language of suffering is inverted. So the details here, this disorganized behavior for 20 days, dresses and undresses repeatedly without any reason, micturating in front of others, suspicious towards others, his wife, self-muttering, spontaneous laughing and crying, talking and with hands and face movements in the air. And as an example of thought disorder, the English translation it says, I want a job, I've come here for a job. So the language of suffering is inverted here into something that suggests that there's something wrong with this person. And it's a legitimized way to say that there is a serious mental disorder. So in all of these, these symptoms are being contextualized. The deep narrative is missing. You have a range of problems that are put down in a numerical fashion. And then a very powerful elephant is just vanished. I put that phrase inspired by Murakami's short story called The Elephant Vanishes. Those of you who've read it must read the uh, book. And then when the family come for a follow-up, the recording says the irrelevant talk continues. And the irrelevant talk is about a job. So that continues. Otherwise, there is an improvement. Comes with the mother. According to the mother, patient is better on medication. No fresh complaints. The irrelevant talk continues. So they continue to give polanthropy and a anticholinergic medication. And so you have a diagnosis for psychosis. You're given antipsychotics. Now, this is, of course, a wider picture of how with fatalities at both ends, there's a criminalization of human activity with alcohol. Elephants are now called as um, rogue elephants. So they have been criminalized. Um, in the words of one of the women whom I talked to, she said, we are not stupid. We have hungry stomachs, they have hungry stomachs. And this problem is not going to go away by blaming them or blaming us alone. I'm going to London now from there because I work on the streets. This is just an example of a church where I go to meet the homeless. And if you see here at the bottom, the city doesn't let you rest or sleep. And if you can't sleep for weeks and weeks and weeks, you're going to develop certain kind of psychiatric morbidity in addition to other problems that you have to deal with. But this is a church. The spikes here ensure that you can't sleep and you can't sleep anyway. And the thing is that if you look at the idea of horizontality, most of us like to be horizontal, but the homeless are not horizontal. Usually it is a necklace way, a slouch, or certain other ways in which you have to rest. But if you go to supermarkets at night, the alarms go off, so you're not allowed to sleep there. So if you're not allowed to sleep all night, then how do you manage? Do you have to look for drugs? Do you have to look for some other ways, refuge, and various things? But in anthropology, there is a, a thumb rule. What happens outside happens inside, and vice versa. So when people come into the clinic, they do bring what is happening in their conversations in the outside world, provided we are willing to listen. In the case of the elephant attack, um, I did share the story with the psychiatrist who had taken down the notes, and I said, did you not know this? And their response was, well, the patient didn't tell us. So it's always blamed them, you know, they didn't tell them. So, uh, the question for me was that this is a huge problem going on. How come the clinicians involved, mental health clinicians, both there and in London, are disconnected from the cultural landscape in which they work? And what is it that happens? And so when I pushed for the inquiry, they said, well, we can record elephant-related problems because it's all around, but there is no header in our case notes to say something about elephants. And I said, why can't you make one up? And they said, no, this you can't. This you can't change. This is a template that comes from New Delhi, this comes from the WHO, and that is linked with the Maudsley. This, this can't change. So you're stuck in these, uh, this is a kind of structural violence, where you repeat this template, you sanitize the language, you turn it into a way where you clean up what bothers people most, because you don't want to deal or hear with that, and you work out a new vocabulary. So 
This is just to give you an idea about the intensive care unit where I worked as a chief. Uh, this is, I call it the panoptic for surveillance because the doctors and nurses sit behind. Everything in the Bachmanian style is fixed to the floor. There's an airlock, only people who are very suicidal or have hurt others seriously br are brought in. But in the process of this lock wards and uh, lock cultures, I found that the staff have also locked their culture out when they come in. And that is an important point. And I don't have time to talk about a similar variant here and what happened. Maybe uh, over coffee, Dutch coffee or Dutch beer and make it go Dutch. <laughs> it talk about it. But the case notes of extracts from this intensive care unit is not this similar from what you saw in the large psychiatric training facility in Northeast Chilea. This is how the inscription takes place. Diagnosis of paranoid, not engaging, not picking up prescription, hostile, made threats to kill, hostile and angry, challenging manner, lacking insight, paranoid ideas about his psychiatrist, no management problems in the ward, appropriate in behavior, interacting, remaining stable. This is 21st century London. And a colleague of mine who's a senior medical anthropologist, Marion Stratton, she reframed a British banker's law which was um, coined by Goodhart, called the Goodhart's Law. And she said, when the measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So why are we so preoccupied with these terms? Because they have a loading. That helps them decide how long you can keep them in the unit there. So your risk assessments and the scores on risk assessments require this vocabulary to order to justify how long you keep them there. And in the process, a lot of what they want to talk about is not heard and not written down. And very often, assessments become incomplete and the repeated readmission rates rise and rise, especially amongst those who are from the Black African Caribbean community. This, this is something I noticed. The problem here is also to do with academic discursive language and health services who are preoccupied with schools. And there isn't a language that can bridge the two. Uh, so just to finish and, and summarize, what I'm arguing is that this critical gaze that you saw, it edits out and erases uh, the suffering of people, but also in the process it reproduces and amplifies uh, the inequalities that exist between us and them. Uh, and this Latanian gaze is transforming what is the mechanism of surveillance in a, in a Benthamian sense to a pan lexicon, where the vocabulary has become so powerful that everyone buys into this vocabulary. And in some ways, these vocabularies diffuse up into the city through other institutions social services, child services, uh, councils who require your reports, legal establishments. And then it, that creates a socially toxic landscape where the power of these words are not independent of the people who are interested or the institutions. And I think I want to go back to the idea of normalization. Homi Baba, who is a culture critic in America, coined the term unhoming, which is that sometimes social and cultural forces around you start changing in a way that when you at a one time felt at home, suddenly feel you don't anymore belong. I will feel that way these days. I don't feel I belong to London or to India with the kind of processes taking place. But that's just a personal disclosure. And I think then the toxic landscape becomes an emergent property. So the unhomed extends to my parent discipline, which is psychiatry, which has unhomed and systematically continues to unhomed by disconnecting and dislocating people from their social landscape. And in the process, the new global health, mental health lobby, the mantra of the global mental health lobby, uh, Van Bagen, glosses over the local. But what is the global? It's a collection of locals. We can't just not attack, ignore the global, because that is what is important. And of course, to extend it, those of you are familiar with the writings of Michael Bakhtin, who developed Dostoevsky's work, especially the novel Brothers Karamazov, and Wittgenstein's contributions of how social suffering and language are constantly shifted and the rich polyphony of, uh, that is embedded within people's utterances is cleaned up into something that is very simplistic, very sanitized, that suits how you make your diagnosis and your treatment. And so I think there is here a rich potential to revisit case notes as a crucial contribution towards the aesthetics of mental suffering, but there's also a stranger case notes. I, it would be superficial on my part to say this is just about the doctor's projects of writing. This goes beyond writing into why do we understand here and frame people in the way we do. I don't want to have time, so I shall finish that. Thank you very much.